Welcome to our webinar um, entitled Healing Centered Youth Organizing, the Integration of Healing into Our Strategies for Social Change. Um, we'll be joined today by um, folks from a number of organizations, um, and, and you'll hear some, some emerging uh, strategies. So um, by way of, of, of kicking us off, um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Um, I'm Albert Maldonado. I am with the California Endowment. I am our youth program uh, manager. Um, and so really excited to to be joining you in this discussion. Um, so um, I just want to give a couple of, of quick acknowledgments. Um, you know, this this uh, webinar is, is being brought to you in partnership between the Urban Peace Movement, Movement Strategy Center, um, and in particular, um, our Center for Healthy Communities. So I want to thank um, our, our center for, for really um, stepping up and stepping in and supporting the, the discussion. So Jen Vanoer um, is our is our lead over with, uh, with CA with the Center for Healthy Communities. So thank you so much, uh, Jen. Uh, we're joined by some pretty, pretty powerful speakers. Um, and really excited about the conversation we're about to have around layering in um, healing-informed approaches into our organizing work, um, our youth organizing efforts. Um, here at the California Endowment, we think that young people, um, you know, really can and 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 should be, you know, equipped with the with the tools uh, to, you know, better understand their communities, better understand their schools, um, and also, you know, kind of embark on on community change strategies. Um, you know, to, to really support sustainable shifts in, in neighborhoods so that we support healthy youth development. Um, that being said, it's also important to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of our young people come from very marginalized communities and there is often, you know, traumas that have um, been unresolved. And so um, what we're learning is that, you know, incorporating an organ, a healing-centered approach into our organizing work has a, a pretty profound impact. So joining us to talk, you know, a little more or to talk deeply uh, in depth about that, um, we're joined by uh, Dr. Sean Ginwright, uh, Nicole Lee, and um, we're also joined by Mara Chavez Diaz. Um, so to begin, I'll just say a few words about each of our speakers. Um, so Dr. Ginwright is um, actually a TCE board member um, and is also a leading national expert on African American youth, youth activism, and youth development. Um, he's an associate professor of education in the Africana Studies Department and senior researcher um, for the Cesar Chavez Institute for Public Policy at San Francisco State. Uh, Dr. Ginwright has founded the Leadership Excellence uh, community-based organization, which is really an innovative youth development agency located in Oakland that trains African-American youth to address um, pressing social and community problems. Um, Dr. Jen Wright serves on the board of the endowment um, and has also really um, lent his, um, his expertise to other foundations, including the Ford Foundation, Spencer Foundation, and the Heinz um, Endowments on philanthropic strategies to support young people um, in urban communities across the country. Uh, Dr. Jen Wright's research examines the ways in which youth in urban communities navigate through um, the constraints of poverty and struggle to create equality and justice in their schools and communities. Um, and so we also have uh, Nicole Lee, uh, who is the executive director um, of Urban Peace Movement, an organization that builds youth leadership in Oakland. She transformed the culture and social conditions that leads uh, to urban violence. Uh, she's a lifelong Oakland resident and has spent the last 18 years in youth development, labor, and community organizing. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have Mara Chavez Diaz, who's a Chancellor's Fellow and PhD candidate um, in the Graduate School of Education in the Social and Cultural Studies program. Um, and her research has really focused on the relationship between healing, academic achievement, and youth civic engagement for urban youth of color. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to my, uh, my close colleague, um, Nicole Lee, who is the Executive Director of Urban and Peace Movement. So, Nicole. Thank you so much, Albert. Hi, everyone. I'm really honored to be on the call today um, and to be in partnership with such incredible people that we'll be hearing from today. Before I get started, I just I wanted to actually dedicate my presentation. Um, I want to dedicate it to Bobby Hall, um, who was a young man from Sobrani Park in East Oakland. Um, and Bobby was a young man that I that I had the opportunity to work with, and he was killed in 2007 um, here in East Oakland. So this is for you, Bobby. Um, as Albert said, today we're going to be talking about a paper that we recently released, which is called a conceptual mapping of healing-centered youth organizing. Um, but before we get into that, I'm actually going to start off by talking about how I arrived at the importance of healing 
to our work with social justice organizing. This story is actually taken from another framework paper that I wrote that's also on Urban Peace Movement's website, and you can actually download both reports um, on the link that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, so our work at Urban Peace Movement grew out of a project that we started called Silence the Violence. Um, in 2006, I was working on a juvenile justice reform campaign here in California, and I had hit one of the worst moments of my organizing career when the 21-year-old son of one of the women in our family's network was murdered here in the streets of Oakland. She had another child who was incarcerated, which was why she had become active in our campaign. So here we were, we were fighting for the young people who were locked up and advocating for them to be free, but it was her free son who actually lost his life in the streets. Um, and you know, while I certainly can't um, even begin to comprehend the pain of this mother, as an organizer, this was a moment where I felt completely demoralized and knocked off my feet. Um, it was a moment where I felt like our work was absolutely pointless. It just so happened that right around that time, a call, uh, actually a mentor of mine had encouraged me to go to this workshop called Landmark, um, and I didn't know what it was, um, but at that workshop I was introduced to these concepts, and the concepts were mindfulness and possibility. So in the workshop, I was asked to examine my current ways of being, which was kind of like a, these were all kind of like foreign concepts to me. Um, so when this situation happened with this homicide occurring, um, that's what I actually did. So I began to inquire not just about what I was doing about the situation, but actually instead about who I was being in this situation. And I realized that who I was being was hopeless, depressed, and completely defeated. So then I began kind of looking around me and trying to figure out who were, you know, who were the people around me being when it came to the violence in Oakland. And I started talking to my friends about it. Some people said that you know, they felt sad and sort of expressed despair about the situation. Other people told me that it made them angry and, that, and filled with rage. Um, and then you know, there were other people, friends of mine, who told me that um, you know, they had lost so many people to homicides in our community that they were numb to the situation completely. And I realized that if you multiply those recurring ways of being by the 400,000 of us that lived in Oakland, then peace really stood no chance at all. So I decided to declare a new way of being, and I declared the possibility of being courageous. But after I did this, I wasn't really sure what to do next, because I'm an organizer, and I'm used to like work plans and you know measurable outcomes and benchmarks, and being courageous didn't really come with a work plan. Um, so a few days later, I was just happened to be driving down the street, and I um, drove past a small candlelight vigil, and it was actually against the war in Iraq at the time. It was only attended by about 15 people, but it was symbolic and it moved me. And I thought to myself, what if we did something like that about the violence that's happening right here in our own backyard? So the next day I went back to the office and I came up with the idea for Silence the Violence Day with two of my coworkers. We set out to organize what we thought would be an ambitious three simultaneous vigils in different neighborhoods in Oakland. Then I mentioned the idea to a couple of my colleagues, and they're actually more than colleagues to me. They're more like my brothers in this work. Um, and those people are Rudy Corpus, Jr. from United Players in San Francisco, and Galen Silvestri from United Roots here in Oakland. And the three of us spread the idea through our networks. Within three weeks, instead of three vigils, as we had planned, there were actually 21 vigils that took place in five Bay Area cities with over 1,000 people attending. At that point, I had been organizing for some time, and I had even won campaigns before. But this first Silence of Violence Day had a kind of momentum that I had never witnessed before in my life. And it showed me what's possible when we put down our hopelessness and our resignation, and when we choose to pick up courage instead. So for me, healing is not just about making people feel better, although it does do that. It's actually about our ability to change our perspective. 30 seconds. So the question that I have now in this work is what becomes possible for our communities when we're able to change our perspective from a perspective of hopelessness to one of courage or from a perspective of self-hatred to one of love for ourselves and for others in our communities. Today's webinar will allow us to hear from a host of amazing activists and organizers who will help us to begin to answer this question. 
So the first person I'm going to turn it over is uh, to is Dr. Sean Jinwright. So thank you, Nicole, for that um, wonderful, rich story. Um, and I think it lends that um, leads us really well into understanding really what are the issues that we are healing from. So the so the question is, we talk about healing and we talk about youth-centered um, or, or healing-centered organizing, but the question is, so what are we healing from? And I think that the first point that I'd like to make is that there are communities who have been and deeply engaged in healing for, for, for a long time. So African communities, Asian communities, Latino communities, indigenous communities, Pacific Island communities have all had uh, particularly effective healing strategies. Um, I want to also acknowledge our elders, um, Maestro Jerry Tail, who's been deeply involved in this work for years. Um, my elder, Baba Arnold Perkins, here in Oakland, who's also been deeply engaged in healing issues in black communities. There's two things I'd like to mention. The first thing is um, my son introduced Kendrick Lamar to me last year. And in, this, in, this, in the song, uh, Kendrick Lamar uses the term good kid, mad city. And I think what Kendrick Lamar does really well is he, he, he illustrates how he is a good kid, but the broader environment that he exists in forces him to make uh, choices oftentimes that are not healthy for his well-being. He's a good kid in a mad city. There are two theoretical concepts that I think really illustrate what Kendrick Lamar um, is sort of talking about. Uh, the first concept um, is called social toxicity. We use the term social toxicity really to illustrate that um, that the environments that we in or that we live in, the neighborhoods, the schools, sometimes even the classrooms and our families are sometimes toxic to our health. And just like there are physical toxins like asbestos or lead paint in the environment, social toxicity are things like fear, anxiety, stress, uncertainty, all of which, if we're exposed to over time, are unhealthy for us. And if they're not cured or, or not supported, they're unhealthy for our well-being as adults and unhealthy for young people. The second concept um, by James Farmer is called structural violence. And I think structural violence is an important concept to understand what young people are healing from because it points to the ways in which the policies, the procedures, the laws themselves are not just blocked opportunities, but that those laws and policies do harm to people. And so the term structural violence allows us to understand uh, the ways in which zero tolerance policies, policing practices, um, uh, uh, practices in schools uh, that, uh, that, that kick young people out, um, not only sort of just block the opportunities that young people have, but they actually do harm to the psychological and social well-being of young people. So those are the concepts that I think are important for us to understand when we ask the question, what are we healing from? And next we're going to sort of hear about different ways in which community organizations are responding to, in, in, in many ways, responding to these two, or these two issues. So before we go on, this is Nicole Lee again, before we move on with the presentation, I just wanted to make sure that folks know that Professor Jenright is actually releasing a new book entitled Hope and Healing in Urban Education, which will be released this September. So please look out for it. We're all incredibly waiting with bated breath for the book to come out. And you can go to his website for information about how to order it, which is seanjinwright.com. Um, and you can see the spelling of his name um, right here on this slide. So it's seanjinwright.com. Um, next, we're going to hear more from Dr. Jinwright as well as from Mara Chavez-Diaz about the project overall and the project uh, methodology and findings. So um, we were curious about um, uh, Nicole shared her story. So we were curious about what are uh, what are the organizations, what are the other people around the state of California actually doing and responding to structural violence and social toxicity? And so um, uh, Nicole put, pulled together a project that essentially wanted to map. Uh, what is happening around the state in relationship to healing and organizing and activism. And so this project really is, is, a, is a snapshot 
that allows us to understand not just the organizations, but the specific kinds of practices and procedures, the kinds of concepts that these organizations are using as they talk about and move a healing-centered organizing approach. And so um, now I will begin um, by sharing some, briefly discussing some key terms. Uh, my name is Mara Chavez Diaz, and I will be um, discussing briefly some key terms for the purposes of our discussion today, uh, beginning with healing. Um, healing for this discussion is understood as the process of moving from injury and harm to optimal health and well-being in mind, body, and spirit. Organizing is understood as a process of building community power to influ influence policies that meet community needs. And trauma is understood as a disruption of healthy psychological, spiritual, and emotional states, resulting from historical and ongoing traumatic events, processes, and environments. Healing-centered organizing is understood as a process that builds collective community power by combining healing and wellness practices with traditional community organizing aimed at changing policies and systems. And as such, it is multidimensional, it acknowledges the link between hopefulness and agency, and it seeks to increase hope and empowerment among communities that have experienced structural violence and inequality. In terms of our research methods for this um, study, um, the guiding questions guiding our study were the following. One, how do organizations understand healing and organizing work? Two, what are some of the principles guiding their work? And three, what kinds of practices inform their approach? Inter interviews were conducted with a sample of community-based youth organizations, and participant observation of key organizational activities were also conducted. Our key finding, findings highlight four healing principles guide healing-centered organizing, and organizations draw from, a diver, from diverse healing modalities to inform their organizing strategies. So the four healing principles that, um, that guide healing-centered organ organizing are number one, healing is in response to the needs of community. Two, healing is political. Three, healing and organizing intersect. And four, healing is found in culture and spirituality. Next, I will briefly elaborate on each of its principles. For principle number one, healing is in response to the needs of the community. Practitioners in this study have a deep and critical understanding of what urban youth of color are healing from. In fact, many of the practitioners draw from their own personal lived experiences. As community activists that come from the same communities and, and are of similar backgrounds as the youth whom they work with. In particular, for practitioners working within historically marginalized communities, they acknowledge and aim to address historical and generational trauma. In this way, practitioners see healing as not only necessary, but vital to communi for communities to cope with trauma and be able to thrive. They integrate healing practices that focus on the whole person's well-being spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. For example, you have restorative justice efforts that aim to amend harm by restoring the individual and collective well-being of young people, and in this way offer an alternative to punitive, zero-tolerance policies that push students of color out of school. For principle number two, healing is political. Practitioners work from a framework that is both sacred and political. There is a shared understanding that healing is a collective process that responds to institutional, systemic, and structural violence. These practitioners move away from dominant understandings of healing that treat it only as an individual process that it's often privatized sees individuals as deficit and pushes for individualized remedies that aim to cure individuals. Instead, these practitioners emphasize how healing requires a collective consciousness about the systemic causes that create harm in the first place. 
and acknowledges the process of facilitating individual and collective healing as political work, and is anchored in the belief that healing ourselves as communities, individuals can be empowered to collectively push for systemic change and be able to imagine and create a more just world. For principle number three, um, healing and organizing inter intersect, practitioners challenge the conventional tendency to view healing and organizing as two separate things. Instead, these practitioners operate from an understanding that the combined approach of healing and organizing can achieve more effective and sustainable results than each of these approaches could achieve on its own. This combined approach addresses the dangers of burnout among social justice activists, many of whom work 40 to 60 hours per week, often working on weekends and sacrificing personal and family time given the tremendous needs in our communities. By merging healing and organizing, organizing itself can be part of a healing process and healing can transform systems. Examples of this principle in action may include practitioners carving out time for their own self-healing and seeing it as a critical part of their professional and personal growth. This may include being intentional about integrating healing wellness practices that may include healing circles, meditation, and somatic practices into, into their staff meetings and when working with youth. For um, principle number four, healing is found in culture and spirituality, many practitioners draw upon the power of cultural and spiritual healing that already exists within communities and which include present day and ancestral ways of knowing. For example, spiritual healing for many of these practitioners is about their connection to spirit and includes addressing existential questions about purpose and meaning. Cultural healing approaches may draw upon ancestral-based teachings and practices. For example, there's the work of the National Latino Fatherhood and Family Institute, which clearly articulate um, a healing-informed model to engage Latino boys and men grounded in indigenous cultural practice and spirituality. In addition, we have practitioners who are also drawing for, from urban youth culture, especially hip hop, as a source of healing, inspiration, and self-expression. Other healing modalities in this area may include spoken word, the visual arts, community gardens, and dance. These diverse cultural and spiritual healing modalities help youth affirm a positive cultural identity that promotes self-love, healing, and self-expression. Um, and so in this table, uh, we have compiled various healing modalities applied within a healing-centered organizing approach. Please reference the article for a more comprehensive table outlining the various modalities and examples of youth organizations throughout our state that are integrating these practices. Um, it is important to highlight that we do not attempt to include all the healing modalities that exist, nor are these categories mutually exclusive. Our goal is to focus on highlighting some of the prominent practices that are utilized. So in this table, for example, we see transformative organizing, which focuses on increasing efforts to win, win social justice and systemic change campaigns by integrating healing, mindfulness, talking circles um, in their organizing model. We also have restorative justice that I shared about earlier. We have contemplative practices that uh, provide pathways to healthy and vibrant ways to see the world, and, and activities may include mindfulness, meditation, positive psychology. We also have faith-based practices that focus, the focus is on a religious basis, based devotion to social justice, and key activities may include um, prayer circles, um, communal gatherings and sharing stories of faith, um, as well, and we also have cultural and spiritual practices that which I elaborating uh, elab elaborated upon earlier. We also have urban youth culture and contemporary um, culture. And now I will turn it over to Nicole, who will be um, sharing some of our findings, uh, some of our recommendations. So before I do that, I just want to give uh, I'm. 
I'm Nicole, and I'm from Oakland, and we like to give shout-outs. So I really want to give a shout-out to Mata because um, when we started this project, you know, we I've ne- I never met her before. And as you can tell, she is just a tremendous mind, but also a tremendous heart and has really become my sister. Um, so I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Mata, for bringing all of your talent. Mata actually grew up here in West Oakland, um, so she's an Oakland girl like me. So I'm just really thankful to have her on this project. Um, so the four recommendations that came out of our report, number one was to embed and institutionalize healing practices into social justice organizations. And in a minute, we're going to be hearing from four of the most incredible organizers from around the state who are doing this. Um, Because a lot of people ask the question, okay, that sounds great, but how do you actually do that? Um, The second recommendation is to build the capacity of social justice leaders to foster healing for themselves and for those with whom they work. Um, A lot of times we think of ourselves as activists and we don't think of ourselves as healers, but a lot of the work, if you actually look at what we're doing, is about healing our communities. The third recommendation is to develop key partnerships between community healers and social justice leaders, um, you know, to to be the bridge between, um, you know, that that key relationship. Um, And then the fourth, obviously, is to increase investment to sustain healing-centered organizing, Um, you know, and that's part of our hope is that the more people become aware about this approach, um, you know, the more emphasis uh, that this approach will receive on many different levels. Um, So I am actually about to uh, make a transition here in our um, presentation. Um, And so the next part of this webinar is perhaps the most important part. Um, And as I said, we're going to hear from four incredible organizers from various regions around our state. Um, All of them are combining healing with the work of creating social justice and systems change. Um, One of the best parts of my job as a community organizer um, is to know that I am in the company of such amazingly talented, dedicated, and compassionate colleagues. Um, So uh, I am really excited. Uh, The first person I'm going to turn this over to is someone who's been doing this work for years, um, someone who many of us from around the state have such immense respect for and look up to, um, and that is Sammy Nunez um, from Fathers and Families of San Joaquin. So, Sammy, are you on the line? Good morning, relatives. Can you hear me okay? This is uh, Sammy Nunez. Uh, My apologies, first and foremost. I am uh, actually uh, losing my voice a little bit here. Um, So I'm gonna try to push through this and express uh, what I feel is some of the most important work taking shape here in Stockton. Um, Let me just first start off by giving thanks. I need to give thanks to our ancestors, thanks to our elders, and a special uh, thanks to all the teachers, all the cultural teachers that have guided me on my journey towards healing. Healing is a personal journey. Um, I have actually um, seen the devastation of unmitigated violence and trauma in our communities. I've experienced it firsthand um, and was quite upset when I first started realizing uh, and recognizing all of the data and all the intersections and systems and practices that were creating these conditions in the first place. Me and others in our community um, were were upset and wanted to take action. One thing I recognized very early on was that there had to be some healing from that trauma, lest you just remain angry. Often the question is asked, in particular by the teachers of the National Compadres Network, who heals the healer? I found my way to my first retiro uh, with the Circle of the Hombres, And that was my first introduction to my own healing journey. Quite frankly, I was a bit taken aback at first because I had never seen men uh, that looked like me and had similar experiences as I talking about their community and talking about family and discussing these things in such a ceremonial and beautiful way. At first, I was shocked, though, because I was not accustomed to it. I remember kind of giving my friend a quick elbow and saying, these guys are weird. What's up with these guys? And my friend uh, quite astutely kind of checked me and said, nah, brother, 
this is the way we're supposed to be. And that was my introduction when I opened up my heart and my spirit to these teachings. And it has been a beautiful journey of self-discovery and reclaiming my own way uh, in a seemingly um, a pathway that was diminished and uh, only led to certain things that too many of our community members are experiencing. I feel like the, it's very important, though, to understand that there is a framework and a philosophy that needs to be shared. Uh, again, I direct folks to the work of the Gathering of Elders, the work of the Brotherhood of Elders, along with the National Compadres Network, to become a little bit more uh, informed about how these uh, approaches are taking root all across California and certainly all across this nation and um, to some degree across the world. We need to heal the world. That is evidence. You don't need to look too far to see evidence of this trauma affecting uh, every part of our uh, shared world here and certainly in our communities, especially like Stockton. Fathers and Families of San Joaquin began uh, as emerged um, because of local community concern and alarm at the simultaneous expansion of prisons, disinvestment in public education, lack of job opportunities, and increased violence. The great majority of this violence affected our neighborhoods, our boys and young men. Um, and the disproportionate discipline that a lot of the systems were practicing was leading to a huge number of school pushouts and suspensions of students of, colors, of, of color, um, what's been called the school to prison pipeline. Um, as a community organizer, um, we started organizing around shutting down uh, the uh, real danger, dangerous environments uh, that were punishing un and, and were promoting unmitigated violence among our boys and men of color, in particular CYA. Uh, California, Stockton is located, by the way, along the 99th corridor. Yeah. Hello. 30 30 seconds. Stockton, Stockton is located yeah. al along the 99 corridor, what is okay. often being called prison alley. What I'd like to say is that within the context of, a pr of addressing the policies and systems that were creating these underlying conditions, we began to build a conversation with our community, trained by the undisputable data and shifting Stockton's reliance on prisons as an economic engine and changing that conversation to invest more in education uh, a lot, initially, we met with a lot of resistance, but that resistance now has given way. Um, I need to talk a little bit faster here. Our work is primarily focused on systems change. However, youth development and youth organizing are inextricably intertwined in a, dyna a dynamic relationship based on the belief and experiences that strong youth organizers need to be strong youth. Likewise, strong youth are powerful organizers for change. So we created a, an environment where we have an intergenerational, multicultural exchange and a healing space that is now starting to multiply here in Stockton. Some of the evidence of this, that the change is happening using this hybrid approach that has become now institutionalized, if you will, into our work and into our community um, has really uh, been now widely accepted. There was resistance, now there is a complete acceptance of these traditions and ways as a form of healing our broader community and creating pathways for our most vulnerable populations. Um, you know, but how do you measure love? What are the metrics of love? How do you do that? How do you create a culture of, of love and healing? Um, certainly there's again evidence that there is that, that things are emerging in Stockton. Not more than two years ago, Stockton was called the most miserable city, labeled as that. Now we're, uh, we just want the all American city based on the work that we are uh, doing with boys and men of color and vulnerable populations and changing conditions and systems. And um, it is creating a healing that is embedded even in our systems that have oftentimes been guilty of traumatizing, further traumatizing their young people. People now are actually uh, on board with this. Um, and now it's about institutionalizing this and sustaining this kind of work. So I am really thankful to be a part of this work. I'm thankful uh, for my teachers, my elders, my community, uh, fellow organizers, uh, because through uh, healing, through hope, 
and organizing uh, healing through culture and organizing through hope is something that I think uh, the rest of our communities can certainly benefit from as we've seen in Stockton. Thank you so much, Sammy. Um, I had the, this is Nicole Lee again. I had the opportunity to actually go to Stockton. Oakland and Stockton have a real connection. And I got to go to Sammy's office. And one of the things that stayed with me is that when, a young, when young people come back from being locked up and they end up somehow at Sammy's office, he says to them, welcome home, brother. Mm -hmm. And that's always stayed with me. So thank you so much, Sammy, for who you are and for all of the incredible work that you've been doing and continue to do. Um, so next up, I'm going to turn it over. We're going to um, head back to, o to Oakland, <laughs> and we're going to hear from Itoro Udafia, who is the Community Education Coordinator at the Black Organizing Project here in Oakland. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Itoro, and I'm really happy to be here with you guys today, really honored. Um, and just a little bit about the Black Organizing Project, or how we lovingly call our organization BOP. Um, we are a grassroots black member-led organization, and we are really focused on black leadership development and also winning meaningful policy change, and most specifically working with black people who are most deeply affected by um, the system we're in. So black low-income communities are our priority, and we say that unapologetically. Um, so just in answering this question of why is healing important, um, and especially just this moment in history for black people, I wanted to begin with a quote from um, Joy Degree's Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, which is a book that we also read in our space, um, in our book club. So the removal of the slave shackle is important, but what about the emotional damage suffered by the enslaved? And this is a question that we've been mired in, I think, since 2009, so since our inception. And we've realized just in our work that you really can't think about um, liberating yourself from structural violence or structural racism without thinking about the damage and the trauma that has been caused. So that has really propelled our work. And maybe to give some examples of that, even with how we began um, the Black Organizing Project before BOP became BOP, it really wasn't about having a campaign. And I think like many people have said here, and especially like Nicole talked about, how a lot of these things can't be measured. You can't have a work plan for trying to figure out how to address <laughs> <laughs> trauma. You actually do have to listen and listen listening is an act of love. So that was our first mm -hmm. aim. That was our target. That was our action to listen to the people. So we started off with listening sessions and just asking questions. What do we as black people get right? Because so much of um, what we hear, the dominant narrative about black people is that really we're miserable people and we're a problem. So we, we thought about that space and we're like, no, we're not a problem. There are actually many things that we get right and that we do well um, for each other and our community. So that was question number one. And then question number two is like, what are you dealing with? What's on your heart? What, what's going on, especially in Oakland? This was, I think, coming off the um, Oscar Krant murder. And I know that um, many people felt some type of way about it, but especially for black people, there was this kind of um, atmosphere of, oh, don't say too much. Don't be angry. Don't be angry in this way. Don't, don't throw over trash cans and all that stuff. And we created a space where it's okay to have your rage. <laughs> it's okay to show anger, to have tears. Now, we don't want to destroy each other with it, but nobody has any right to tell you you don't have a right to it. So out of that, we started to talk about issues that really meant something to us. And um, I think there were four things that was mentioned that um, we were talking about during those times, saying that this is something that's really affecting us. Number one was state violence, especially um, through the police. <laughs> Number two was um, black on black violence. And it was the larger question of why are we killing each other? Why are we hurting each other? How did we get to this point? Um, number three was um, unemployment. Where are the jobs, man? <laughs> we, we're walking outside. We can't get employed. And number four 
which was really what put energy in our campaign and created our Bettering Our School Systems campaign was this whole question of are the children well? What is going on with our youth? Are they okay? And out of that came the Bettering Our School Systems campaign. Um, I don't know if some of you around this table, I'm sure, know of the murder of Raheem Brown. He was um, a Skyline, not a Skyline High School student. He was actually going to a dance at Skyline High School and he was shot by school police. And um, of course it was some silly excuse that the police gave or whatever that um, he was trying to fight the police officer, whatever. Um, but this boy, this young man lost his life and we saw the tears of the mother. And we were so, I think, enraged by it that we just started to ask questions like, wait, we have school police? How much money y'all get in? So I think we found out they had like upwards of $10 million for a COPS grant to put police in our schools. So we just started to ask more questions. We were like, first of all, do we really need police? Number two, why can't more money go to restorative justice programs, more counselors, more teachers that reflect the communities they come from, that look like us, that love us? And then out of that, we started to really push for policy. So I say all of this to say that it wasn't first about the campaign, it was first about mobilizing our power together, first of, of us seeing eye to eye to one another and trying to heal that primary relationship before we started to think about the institutions and the policy. Now in order for us to really like mobilize to fight those policies and stuff, we, we became 30 seconds, okay, I gotta wrap up. We became emboldened through our relationship with each other to really say we can mobilize now and have the power to speak truth to our power. And we had some real wins, and I think one of them was the elimination of will, willful defiance in um, OUSD, Oakland Unified School District, which was a really punitive policy that um, you know said if you roll your eyes, if you all this stuff, you could be suspended or expelled. And this was happening to a disproportionate amount of black children. So um, just to echo what um, some of my other colleagues said, really allowing space just to talk and to listen and to love has been important to our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Itoro. We really appreciate that. Um, BOP is one of the most amazing organizations here in Oakland, and I really hope that we can find ways to partner with each other in the future. So thanks so much. Um, next up, we're gonna drive just up the road. Um, and we're going to end, uh, end up in Richmond, um, and we're going to hear from Joe Kim. Joe is a clinical case manager um, and an amazing person. I've gotten the opportunity to know Joe through the BMOC camp that we're all, the Sons and Brothers camp that happens, um, that many of us are a part of in the summer. Um, and Joe is from the RISE Youth Center in Richmond. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first off, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor um, to be at this kind of digital table. Uh, with so many um, powerful healers uh, from around uh, the state. Um, and just personally, I think it's in incredibly validating uh, to hear about the work that's happening um, because it's so aligned with with um, what we've been doing at the Rice Center. Um, and so uh, just r really grateful to be here. Um, so the Rice Center is a, a youth center that was uh, developed uh, out of youth organizing based in Richmond, um, it really it started because young people um, had the courage, um, Nicole was talking about courage, uh, to really begin to organize and start to push against adults um, after a, a string of really violent homicides that happened in Richmond. Um, young people got together and said we needed something different, and so they, they wanted to create a, a safe space, um, and that's how the Right Center was really born. Um, and so we, we serve young people 13 to 21, but um, more accurately, I think we serve, uh, we're, we're in solidarity and service to the communities that kind of bear uh, these inequitable, bur uh, inequitable burdens of, of multiple layers of trauma and oppression uh, that exist. Um, and then also are blamed and then stigmatized uh, for, the, for, those, uh, for coping with those traumas. Um, and so we, we, we think it's really important to recognize those um, and individuals and, and what they experience in their stories on all levels. Um, it's really important that we, we do that. Um, I just really wanted to echo what a lot of folks have already said and then share a little bit about our listening campaign that we went on, um, which is very, so aligned with what uh, Itara, you were just speaking about. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, 
But I think uh, one thing I want to point out is that we view healing really as a revolutionary act. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, we recognize that trauma is, is, uh, is, exists on multiple levels. It's multifaceted, um, uh, intergenerational, um, historical trauma. Uh, we, we, we feel like we need to be able to say that and bring that to the table when we do talk about trauma. Oftentimes it's... Um, it's kind of viewed very, in a very isolated way that individuals kind of experience trauma um, on a very acute um, kind of interpersonal level. Uh, but we want to recognize that uh, young people that go to school, they, they carry, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of pervasive and, and exists on all levels. Um, when they're at school and the systems that they engage with, when they're at home um, and, and what they deal with at home. So we want to be able to recognize all of that. And for us, healing really means the acknowledgement of all of those wounds that we carry as individuals and as a community. Um, and, that we, and we have to recognize that often we pass these wounds down to our young people. We pass them on um, to our coworkers, um, to the, the, the partners that we engage with in doing the work that we do. Um, and, uh, so on all of these levels, we really have to uh, be mindful of how we engage. Um, and so uh, something that we practice uh, is really how do we transform the relationships that we are in with each other. Um, and we do that uh, with a lot of the traditional kind of healing practice that we have um, and recognizing that those are our, our traditional ways of healing. Um, and so really shifting the relationships that we have with each other is really where we find is is important on how we begin to shift structures, uh, systematic violence. Um, so, so we went out and um, conducted a listening campaign. It's or this is this is where I think we're really really aligned. Um, we went out and we just wanted to listen. Um, and as you see on the slide, you know we have the quote: "The first duty of love is to listen." And so we wanted to um, just do that. You know, I think so many. Um, so many of us in this work focus so much on what do we do, how do we work, how do we get into it, how do we dive into it, um, and often don't take time to just pause and kind of acknowledge the wounds. Um, and any doctor will tell you, you got to know what you're looking at before you begin to treat it. Um, and so we went out and uh, we conducted a listening campaign. We uh, interviewed and held focus groups for um, over 450 young people in Richmond. And our, our focus was what are your experiences of trauma um, and violence? How does it affect you? Uh, and how do you ultimately cope with it? How does it show up and how do you cope with it? And then um, lastly, what do you need from us as adults, as adult allies, uh, to begin the process of healing and coping? Um, and so that's our, you know, we, work, we worked with the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, um, and there's just uh, so much data uh, that we've gathered around this, um, and we're, you know, I can't really do it justice in the time that we have today, um, but we're more than uh, willing to share it out, have discussions about it, so please do contact us if you're interested. Um, so we started with um, kind of community surveys. We went into classrooms. Seconds. We did focus groups. Uh, we did interviews with young people. Um, and, you know, we, I just shared a little bit on the slide kind of what came up um, as kind of emergent findings and themes. Um, but uh, just real quickly, I wanted to share that um, when we went into these focus groups, uh, when we say trauma is per pervasive and assumed, we not once did we walk into a room and young people were like, hmm, what do you mean by trauma? I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, it was scary how, how, how easily they were able to, to channel that part of their experience. Um, and so these, these focus groups were, were heavy. They were really heavy. Um, and we asked young people, what, what do you need from us as adults? You know, because we were walking out, even the folks conducting the surveys were walking out of the rooms just like in tears, and it was a lot. And we asked young people, what do you need from us? And what they said was more focus groups. Um, and what we took that as is, is, is more spaces that young people are able to validate each other's experience, see each other, recognize that it's, although it, it's felt so uh, in such an isolated way, that really it exists on a community level that we can recognize each other, and that's kind of where the healing begins. Um, and so I, uh, what we practice really is, is about how do we intentionally listen, not as a passive thing, but as a very active and uh, revolutionary act. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, 
I wish that we had more time for all of you guys because I could hear, I could listen to each of you talk for you know, you know, much longer than we're. Um, but unfortunately, um, we're limited in time, and so I want to make sure that we get to all of our speakers. Um, our, our next speaker is actually our fourth and final speaker, um, who's somebody that I have had the privilege of being in partnership for the last year, um, who is Juan Gomez. Um, Juan is the executive consultant? No, I'm the senior advisor. The senior advisor, so sorry. The senior advisor from MILPA, which is a collective based in East Salinas. Um, and we've actually been doing, uh, my organization with United Roots has a African American young men's group called Determination, and we've been doing an exchange with MILPA over the past year. Um, so we're incredibly honored to have Juan join us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Juan. Um, well, good, good morning, buenos dias. Uh, just wanted to give thanks to everybody in, the, in this room right here, first and foremost, because you know, it's the first time that I've been in a room with so much diversity, right? And if and if we're going to be bringing these things to the forefront, that it's good that we do it like this, you know, not just because of the diversity and inclusion, but the balance, you know, that I see here. Um, so that's good. The other thing is also just thinking about, you know, the elders, you know, first and foremost, you know, uh, folks like, you know, National Compadre Network, the, the Brotherhood of Elders, you know, who've kind of started some of those, those first teachings around healing, you know, but, you know, for me personally and Milpa, I, th I think about, you know, Maestro Roberto Castro and, and Marcia Rincón Gallardo from Norstein who are helping us actually take the healing and now incorporate the practices and the expertise really needed to kind of go across this long march and uh, kind of advocate and be in, in, the, in the struggle like that. Um, Milpa, Motivating Individual Leadership for Public Advancement, is out of Salinas, and it grew out of a bunch of us who either were from Salinas or from the area and knew each other from the California Youth Authority in Tamarack and Preston, or you know they actually went to school together, or that are that we just knew each other from our our, our, uh, our colleagues in the streets. And you know the first thing that we did was go to each other, you know, and saying there was it wasn't like L.A. or, or, or Oakland. Oftentimes when you guys can shut it down, you know, for us it was like we had to build it, and we had listened for some time already about what needs to be done, and just kind of picked up that baton. So our, our focus is really to build out the, the internal dialogue, you know, and will of people in a way that was healthy and honor them when, as they're coming into this work. Oftentimes our folks will fight for everything, but they will never be honored. So we wanted to have that. So that focus on healing is important, but more importantly also, or not as more importantly, but at the same time was that leadership readiness. Not just the capacity, but the readiness that some of these folks are ready to hit, you know. So we thought about it like that, but also the professional development that they need to be in these spaces. You know, like here, you know, we're actually at the table here, not on the menu, right? And also with that focus of going from outcomes to incomes, because we want to ensure that our people have professional development and networking so they could, we can get them jobs or hook them up with our networks. And that's how we like to do, right? Um, and I think through what you just mentioned that this healing work, you know, it's more around being relational rather than transactional. So the work that we're doing with the United Roots, with the Urban Peace Movement is because of that, you know, that it's relational. So we go to each other's spot we're building. You know, same thing with like Courage in Stockton, the folks in Denver, folks in Santana, different places, that that's how we should, you know, kind of come into this work. The other part, you know, Milpa is really uses culture, consciousness, and movement building. Once again, the rites of passage of not just, um, you know, gender specific, but gender fluid you know, and starting so that we ha we can appear at the table as who we really are in our different identities, you know, um, and make space for that and also struggle through that space, right? Um, but through that culture, really focus on the inner and, and social transformation. Um, and through that consciousness, oftentimes some folks love the culture, some people are put off by the culture, but a lot of folks are, are attracted through pop ed and like racial justice, so we get folks from both angles. Right, and also building like solidarity so they know that they we're coming together with brothers and sisters from all ways, right, and that we're, we're united because of the struggle, not by issue. So that's really important to us because oftentimes I feel that our ground, grassroots, and even our folks who are researchers or, or lawyers, we've been pitted against each other rather than being conducive with each other towards, you know, building power. And I think, you know, we've been occupying that space across the state, and I think now hopefully through some of this work, some investment, uh, hopefully nationwide, right, because I think that we have to also not just think about the right or, or the red, we've got to think about us. Um, 
the other part of it is just kind of the movement building that it is really emerging now as like the, the social determinants of health around the new social justice, around cultivating valores. At MIPA, we talk about cultivating change makers. We see that, right? But as we're doing that, we're not just thinking about policy and systems change. We have to start thinking about kind of building power. I'm talking about voting, about civic leadership. How are our people running for city council or board of supervisors and all these things, but that they're rooted? We want that type of approach. So I'm hoping that in this table, that's a, that we're pulling that type of thing that we're, like I said, we will see ourselves as leaders in those positions, not just kind of asking for these things. Um, and the ability to really think about inside outside, not just on the ground and in those kind of like ivory tower levels, but also with folks behind the walls, with folks, you know, in prison and, and, and YA or wherever they might find themselves. And having compassion for each other is really important because it's hard, you know, and, and that's where kind of healing comes from when we're thinking about healing. That's kind of our answer to health insurance. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We might not be able, it's hard to get health insurance. I've really got it recently myself. <laughs> you know, so even, you know, depending on the healing so much, you know, to address the social emotional things that happen in this movement. Just when you think you got to win, they throw a curveball at you and you're like, what? And you're all pissed off. So this is allows you to kind of say, have integrity, you know. Um, 30 so like seconds. I said, for us, you know, we really want to build out. You know, we really think pushing ourselves, you know, a lot of us are formerly incarcerated, um, but also we really want to build out, you know, with different folks, especially the LGBT community, you know, and really making space so that we see each other and, and deconstruct things that are unhealthy and also elevate things that are, that are healthy, right? So as, as Milpa, you know, with you all right here, like I said, I, I'm thinking that uh, we can do something really good. But once again, you know, muchas gracias for having me here. I'm hoping to be other things, and I'm hoping to look at another webinar where we can talk a little bit more about some of the actual practices around healing, right? So I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> but thanks to you, Sean, for that book because, wow, you did really good along with you, Mara. It's a great piece. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, I am just present to what in what an incredible group of people. Uh, so. Folks can't see us, but we're actually all, um, with the exception of Sammy Nunez, who's in Stockton, um, the other presenters are all sitting around uh, a table together here in Oakland. And um, I'm just present to how privileged um, and, uh, you know, just honored and blessed that I am to be able to work with folks like this from around the state. And it really, you know, we're up against so much in terms of the kinds of issues, uh, you know, that Sean was describing when he was talking about structural violence. Um, and it often feels like that sort of, you know, I, that um, kind of like a David and Goliath type of situation. Um, but when I hear and when I really look into the hearts of the people sitting around this table and, you know, and also Sammy on the phone, um, it gives me a lot of hope that we have enough to actually um, create the kind of world that we know that our people deserve. So thank you guys so much for presenting. Um, before we uh, move into questions, I also wanted to uh, give an acknowledgement, a shout out if you will, um, to Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice. Uh, George Galvis is one of my colleagues here in Oakland um, who has become an incredible partner to me in the work um, over the past few years. Um, and George, unfortunately, he was going to join us today, but unfortunately he is en route. As Mata was talking about, many of us work crazy hours, you know, like traveling all over the country and trying to balance all these things. And George is coming back from the East Coast, and his flight was delayed, and so he's actually on a flight right now. But I wanted to acknowledge his work and um, to definitely encourage people to go to Courage's website. It's C-U-R-Y-J dot org um, to find out more about George George's work and the work of Courage. Um, so next up, I'm going to turn it over um, to Carmen Iniguez uh, from Movement Strategy Center, who has been um, aggregating the questions that folks have been typing into the chat box, hopefully. Um, and so Carmen is going to help us facilitate um, a sort of question answer discussion um, segment for the remainder of our time together today. Carmen, are Hi. you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, great. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This has been really wonderful to, to hear and, and to, I'm also in Oakland for folks who are calling in. I'm in a separate room, so I'm, I'm feeling the love from across the hallway. I have two questions and I wanna encourage people to continue typing in questions. Um, so please use your chat box to ask questions and we will try to get to as many as possible. This first question is coming from Sergio Cuellar. Um, how has this work been implemented in the institutions, the systems that are in touch with our communities and young people? Um, it's a multi question, so I'm gonna add the second question that he typed in. How has this work been accepted and what work is needed to be able to work with these systems better to provide what young people need? So this is a general question to all of the all of the presenters. You know, for us in Stockton, actually that was uh, really vital if we're going to change the kind of trajectory that we're currently on. Uh, and we were very intentional. We created like many other communities, Stockton, uh, Stockton and Oakland and uh, others have the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color and other work. I mean, I've, actually, I will say that historically we've organized from the outside. Uh, now we are actually creating organizing and uh, healing uh, and even the systems, like I mentioned before, and using a structure through the uh, the California or the San Joaquin County Alliance for Boys and Men of Color that uses a community driven approach using the voices of boys and men of color themselves as the leading voices to shape the structure, the priorities, and the direction of the Alliance. We ensure through this process that the spirit of our young men uh, and, and our community are infused uh, and not only the, just their experiences, their voices, and they are active participants. participants. Uh, and this, this is central to our approach. So we literally have healing circles with system leaders uh, probation, uh, the probation department, law enforcement, others, uh, and recognizing, first of all, the trauma and the pain of our people, but also recognizing that there has to be a, they have to hear from these voices and learn from them in order to shape a new trajectory so we don't, so we can rewrite our future and don't have a default future. Okay, let's hear from other folks in the room. Thank you, Sammy. Um, this Juan Gomez, I'm going to say, I think that that's kind of a two-part question, even though you only answered, asked once. And the main thing, I think, is having to even get the healing work validated amongst our people on the ground doing the work and gaining kind of some uniformity around it has been a big challenge, right? And also to keep it authentic, right? But I think the other part is, and especially the endowment, the endowment funds so much money. Here's a good example, school discipline. School discipline was on no one's radar. All of a sudden, it's just like the thing to do. Healing needs to be part of every work plan, the same that communications is and capacity building, right? Because when that happens, you it, it, it just creates a, a little bit more com comfortability that, oh, this is something that, you know, is pretty legit, especially um, from kind of a big entity. But I think also to not just also just rely on a big kind of structure like the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, because although helpful, I think a lot of the organic work that has been here, you know, local leaders like authentic, you know, balanced work. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll take a little bit of pushback, you know, but I think a lot of their healing work has allowed them to message out ways and organize in ways that, that also, um, you know, humanizes the movement. Thank you, Juan. Other folks in the room? Joe yeah, Vitoro. Mm -hmm. This is Joe Kim um, from uh, the Rice Center. Uh, just to build off of what Juan said, I think um, something that we've been doing at the Rice Center, um, every spring we have a trauma and healing uh, learning series where we invite uh, community service partners, um, all, kind of all folks um, on all levels that work with young people and engage with young people uh, to be able to come to this space um, and we kind of have uh, local practitioners, um, healers, folks from kind of different uh, different areas of healing um, healing work uh, to be able to come and learn what what everyone else is doing, and so that we can kind of have a ground base of where we're operating from as a community, um, so that we're aligned when we talk about um, harm reduction or um, when we talk about restorative practices. What does that mean, and how how are we on the same page with it? Um, I think it's important that we do that, and really those spaces uh, oftentimes look like healing circles. And one thing that we le learn from the listening campaign is that young people want adults to do our job, and that, that means they want us to get, get rid of our stuff, you know what I mean? And that means uh, working it out with each other before we pass it on to them. 
Um, so a lot of those spaces that we have uh, are, are about how do we create more um, healthy relationships with each other before we pass that on. Thank you, Joe. Itoro, do you want to add, chime in here? Sure. Um, so just echoing what everyone said, I, we're a base building organization, so we, of course, we always focus on what the base needs, especially with our youth. So um, just thinking about our summer programming, we're really focused on right now just defining our own definitions of some of these larger concepts we've been given, like restorative justice, liberated communities. Well, what does that look like for us? So for um, our older youth space, we're going to really be talking about that in our um, summer youth program and talking about what does um, liberation look like in our communities, bringing in local practitioners to help us in facilitating that, and allowing ourselves a chance to dream and dream outside of some of these institutions. Great. Thank you, Itoro. We're going to move to the next question. I also want to remind folks on, on the phone or on the video to type in your questions regarding um, the report itself. If you have questions about that, please feel free to put them into the iChat box as well. This next question is from Abril Ramirez, who is, um, I'm sorry, actually, let me, I skipped one question, from Anna Christie, who is asking about referrals and recommendations. She runs a high school health and leadership program um, that works with young women in San Francisco and is looking for uh, recommendations or referrals on how to connect with um, community healers. Anybody have any best practices around how to connect with community healers? If you want to implement this in your organization, um, in the work that you're doing, how do you best connect? How do you find um, healers to, to connect with your work? I think um, if our websites are all posted right here. Um, you can probably just reach out to any of uh, one of us. Um, and it just depends what you're looking for. You know, obviously, I'm thinking if you're looking at, at doing some work with, with you know, African American males, United Roots Determination Group is an excellent, you know, place. If you're looking at doing some work around, you know, just with more gender specificness, um, you're looking at maybe the National Compadres Network, right? Um, those are some of the places that I think off the top of my head. I think it's also really important to recognize that there is a community of practice that is emerging and that there's ways that even instructors and principals, I think that we often look at you know, somebody else to become that healer and really creating healing spaces that are conducive to the type of outcomes that you want. I would highly recommend that you look at some training and staff development to create uh, these kinds of uh, environments. We need to go beyond our, our, our places uh, of healing and bring healing to the barrio, bring healing to other spaces, bring healing to City Hall. <laughs> they need a lot of healing. Uh, and so I think, it's, I think that it's starting to expand and I would highly encourage you to uh, uh, look for uh, opportunities for your development and creating these spaces there at your high school. Anyone else with a recommendation on how to get connected with healers locally? Okay, we're going to move to the next question, and this is from Wanda. Um, she says, I represent a cultural institution that does healing through sacred African and African American music and movement. We would like to offer our services and expertise. How do we connect with the organizers? I'm going to just jump in and, and, and suggest again um, for folks who are wanting to connect with the presenters to please um, refer to their websites for their contact information. This uh, webinar is also being recorded and will be shared out with contact information as well. Um, this question is, um, how do we get on the list for RISE Learning Series? Sounds great. So, Joe, you want to you say how folks can sign up for the learning series? Uh, yeah, I just, I just typed in um, a, a response to Jennifer. Um, but if you can contact Karen Paul uh, Dhaliwal, who is our uh, community health uh, Director of Community Health and Integrative Practices at RISE, um, just and and just uh, put in the title that you're interested in the in the Trauma and Healing Learning Series. Um, we ho hold them on Wednesdays. They start uh, um, in the springtime, so we're actually on our fifth uh, session. And tomorrow morning is going to be 
um, uh, facilitated by uh, Erica Woodland um, from the Bo uh, Brown Boy Project here in Oakland. Um, and, and it's going to be about exploring gender justice, trauma, and healing. Um, so every session is something different, um, but uh, definitely um, I, I'm pretty sure we still have room. So if anyone is interested, um, please come through. I've listed Compal's email also on, uh, on the text box. Great. And for folks who may not be online and are just calling in, her email is conrapal at arisecenter.org, K-A-N-W-A-R. P-A-L at RISE Center, that's R-Y-S-E Center.org. You can also find her contact information at the RISE Center webpage. Um, this next question is um, uh, from Johnny Ramirez, and this is uh, via Tim, their youth organizer. How would one begin this healing work if they might have gone through the same type of trauma? Um, like I, I work with undocumented youth, but I am not undocumented, but I am an ally. Can being an ally really validate them in their struggles? So now As I was, started. Go, for it. go ahead, um, Sammy. I can. Oh, Sammy, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, I think it is a personal uh, journey. Uh, there's definitely uh, there's opportunities to get involved. In, in really uh, in our own, we have to be in connection and relationship to our own healing needs as well. Because sometimes we can do some uh, more harm than good when we don't recognize that. So I think that's a really profound question that we actually are in, in, embarking on our own healing journey as well. And there's opportunities for that, um, especially um, you know through the Circulo de Hombres. Uh, they have annual retreats um, where men gather and actually share philosophy and have a spiritual exchange. Because if we're going to renew our communities, um, sp spiritually, economically, um, socially, then we have to recognize that uh, the change and the renewal and healing begins with yourself. Once you heal, then you start to notice that your family heals. Once communities start healing together, great things can happen. But I think that it's really important to recognize our own healing journey in the process as well. Thank you, Sammy. Nicole, did you want to chime in? Sure, I'll chime in on that. Um, actually, can, do you mind rereading the question for me? Yes, the, the essence of the question is how do you how do you embark in this t healing work if you yourself have not gone through a similar experience? If you're not yeah, so reflecting. I can, I can um, answer that question because I actually, you know, so I grew up here in Oakland. I'm actually a fourth generation Oakland resident. Um, and I grew up in a multicultural context, so I didn't grow up only knowing Asian people. I, oh, sorry, you guys can't see me. <laughs> I'm Chinese American. Um, oh, you saw a photo of me earlier. And um, but I didn't grow up in a in an Asian, predominantly Asian community or context. Um, and so um, the work that I do is in a multicultural setting. So I'm often working. So for example, one of the projects that we co-hold, co-facilitate. Um, that I mentioned earlier is determination. It's actually on the slide. Uh, the group is actually on the slide. It's an African American young men's group. So obviously, I don't facilitate those sessions. Um, the facilitator is actually in the picture. His name is Adimu Madun. Um, but I do come to some of the sessions and I deliver trainings once in a while. Um, and so for me, you know, I am an ally to uh, many of the young people that I work with, and they come from, you know, a very diverse range of backgrounds. Um, many, most of which do not mat match mine. Um, so I work with, you know, some y young people that are undocumented, some that are Latino, some that are African American, you know, some that are, uh, you know, Asian but a different Asian ethnicity and sort of, you know, upbringing. Um, and uh, so to me, the most important thing is um, all of us as human beings have experienced um, trauma and even structural violence because, um, you know, th one of the things that I realize about this is even if you lived in a more, what we consider to be a more privileged background, you actually are also experiencing some of the negative trauma that structural violence is causing in terms of the kind of separation that we live in in our society where, um, you know, we have these deep kind of inequalities. There are impacts that happen on people living in the suburbs. There may be different impacts, but their impact, uh, you know, similarly as we see the impacts of, uh, you know, folks living in low-income urban communities. Um, to me, the most important thing is to have is to really know yourself 
um, right? And uh, I think a lot of our work is about knowledge of self. Um, and so for me, as, as a fourth generation Chinese American that grew up in a predominantly African American city, um, that is a, a complex thing, right? Knowing myself. Um, and so for me, it's about um, just having integrity and honesty in, a, in about my own story and about my own experience and about the, my trauma. Um, and it might look different than the trauma that our young people have experienced, but it, uh, it allows me to open my heart to the trauma that they're experiencing. So I think you have to start, you know, just like Sammy said, with your own journey and your own healing um, and have that opening in your heart take lead you um, in how to, be, how to be and how to help young people hold what they're going through. Thank you, Nicole. Anyone else from, that's at the table, Juan, Joe? Yeah, this, this is Sean Jenner. I just really quickly, there's a tendency for, particularly for folks that are in education um, and some folks in youth development to want the curriculum. I saw a question around what is the curriculum, how you do this. And I want to just really make the point that it's not necessarily what you do as much as it is is who you be. And there's a, there's a conceptual shift from thinking about how to work with young people in terms of what we do. Um, but the question was really about how do, I, how do we do this um, if, if, you're, if an individual is, is, has experienced trauma, him or herself. And, this, and I, I responded kind of a knee-jerk reaction is you don't, right? Meaning that in order to be effective and create healing spaces for young people, um, adults need to be deeply committed, engaged in their own healing process. And so there are three things I want to say that I found that everyone around this table and anybody engaged in healing, um, I would, I, I suspect, um, uh, is engaged in. The first, Nicole already recognized, which is recognize your trauma. What has caused the disruption in your normal, healthy, vibrant life? What was that event? Name it and don't hide it anymore. The second is saturate yourself in a loving community of support. Oftentimes we try to grind through the day in environments and workplaces that are not conducive to healing. And so we, we know something happened, but we're not saturated. We don't have conversations with people that can actually hold our secret and hold the kind of conversations we need to have. And then the third practice is develop an individual practice of joy. What do you do every day that brings you peace and joy. We do not have to apologize in the social justice movement for experiencing joy. We don't have to use terms like struggle anymore. We don't have to use these terms that are, that are, that are, not, that are not healthy for our own, uh, our own sense of peace and well-being. And so we need to claim and practice our sense of joy. And those are three things that everyone around this table, and I suspect everyone who's engaged in healing work, uh, are deeply engaged in. Thank you for that, Sean. Other folks around the table who want to chime in on this question or offer recommendations? I'm looking at the time and I, I want to make sure we get to this question. Um, and this is a question from Sandra Davis. And it is, what is the advice to funders on best practices in funding this work? So we are all in agreement that this is needed. It's vital. What is the recommendation to funders? Well, just really quickly, um, the first thing is the language that we use. Right, so there's a tendency to call things trauma-informed, which is important. But um, I want to note that that there's an intentionality around calling it healing-informed and, and healing-centered because we should be de we should not be defining ourselves by by what happened, but defining ourselves about our possibility. Um, and then the second is um, really what are the metrics for our impact, right? And there's a tendency for funders to develop the metrics of which groups have to achieve. Um, and I would, I would, I would push um, uh, 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 program officers and foundations to think about how communities define impact, right? What are the ways in which young, uh, these community organizations define impact? Um, it might not actually be a policy win, but it might be that they've actually built a, a broader network, uh, built a, you know, more power in terms of their base. It might be, uh, it might actually be policy wins, but I think that uh, to be open and flexible around how communities uh, are defining impact for themselves. Thank you, Sean. Other folks?
You know, I think, I think, I think for sure. Here, so. Go ahead, Juan. Oh. So then, okay, um, I, I think one of the main things is uh, for, for funders to also experience this, um, th this process, right, th this, uh, this commitment, I think most funders, if not all, got into this work, you know, because they wanted to do something good. And it's one of it is also to kind of giving themselves the permission to write like that, to think like that, to be like that, as a response to the community, not just to like the man, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very important that 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 there's a there, that there's that type of shift, you know, and that it can happen now. But the outcomes that we want, that we have to be responsible for them. So it's not okay no more to you know hold people to a certain standard and not give them the tools you know, or, or, or share with them so they can build out their own, like you say, manifestation of what, what possibility could look like. Thank you, Juan. Sammy? First of all, shout out to Sandra, my sister, um, in this movement. And uh, I just, I, I echo all the sentiments. I think that it's important to recognize that oftentimes uh, we're not involved in the process. I think, first of all, we need to kind of change that dynamic and be involved in the process itself because, quite frankly, uh, as they say in dominoes, not all money is good money. Uh, at times, a movement can be uh, interrupted uh, by some kind of uh, investment that starts to either shift the healing work and the sustainability of systems change work and organizing that happens on the ground. Um, and so I think it's important that uh, there are coalitions, there are trusted leaders and uh, structures in place uh, that is really lifting this work up. And I think it's safe to say that we know who they are and what communities they're in and how they're representing. Uh, so I think there should be some alignment between the needs of the community and 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 the investments and priorities of the uh, foundations. It is at the end of the day, a reciprocal process. Uh, we have actually now uh, in Stockton received a pretty significant accomplishment and grant in a trauma recovery center that's going to uh, open up for delivery of comprehensive clinical services. Um, and in the process, we felt we were uh, very um, good in receiving this because actually we're, we're, we're informing that process as well. Uh, and I think that's important that we allow for kind of an exchange of information and best practice that is grounded in indigenous community. Uh, and we are able to shift our uh, our practices, um, and so I, I think that that's really a, a really significant thing that this is growing. The movement around healing communities that have been uh, exposed to all of these different conditions is now the environment, and it's it's shifting. So a big part of that is I I think people like TCE uh, and the leadership there get it, uh, and they're invested in it, and so uh, I think that's a really good exchange, and it becomes and and it goes back to what we talked about before. It relates it's relational. At the end of the day, it's a relational process. Thank you, Itoro, Joe, Nicole. Any recommendations for funders as we're nearing the time? Um, I think the only thing I have to offer are some of the things we think about as an organization. Just that um, healing is a process and it takes time. So I know on your end, um, there's usually a timeline. <laughs> so just considering that then for us too, that it takes time and it, it'll look different too, depending on the community and the context. Thank you, Itoro. Uh, Joe? Yeah, uh, I mean, just to echo what I think a lot of folks have already said, um, and, and specifically what uh, Dr. Jenright said, I think we need to be in partnership and collaboration with the communities that we serve um, in order to uh, allow them to define what success looks like. How do we measure success? Um, I think somebody said, how do, how do we measure love or um, uh, the quality of relationships that we build? I think that's um, kind of how we define success, folks that are in the work. Um, and I, I don't know how that shows up in terms of deliverables and you know measurables. Um, but I think we need to be in honest communication about what that looks like. 
Thank you, Joe. And before I pass it off to Nicole to close us out, I just want to remind folks that the recording of the webinar will be shared and all of the presenters welcome your questions and um, your communication. So please feel free to direct questions to them. You can find their contact information on the webinar as well as on their web pages. Nicole? Thank you so much, Carmen. I just want to say thank you to all of our incredible speakers today. Um, I, I just am so moved and inspired by all of your work. Um, and I also wanted to give a shout out to the folks behind the scenes that made this happen. There was a, a huge team of tech people that have been on the call for hours trying to make this technology work. So I just appreciate everyone. Thank you to the California Endowment and Movement Strategy Center for partnering with us on this. Um, and we appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today.